start the presentation. Okay. Um, let's start with the agriculture in Ireland. The land for agricultural use in Ireland is almost 72%. And 92% of that is grassland, and the grazed grass is the most efficient feed for grass-based ruminant systems. But there, there is grass and a different type of grass. So which grass should the farmer choose? And we've got uh, a recommended list of grass and white clover varieties that uh, the Irish farmers use to find the best varieties for their needs. And what it tells you, it gives you a variety name. Uh, as well as some information on spring growth, summer growth, autumn growth, uh, quality, silage, and persistence for each varieties. And as you can see, it also gives you a pasture profit index value for the variety, and they are then ranked from the best to the, to the poorest. And obviously, if you are breeding and developing new cultivars of perennial ryegrass, you would like to have your variety on the recommended list and as well very high on the recommended list so that the farmers will be buying your seed. But how do you develop improved grass cultivars? We've got a whole system for this called forage improvement. And the first most important um, stage of the, of the process is uh, one cycle of the product development called genotypic recurrent selection. Uh, so it takes around seven years in our case. Then, then we move on to the phases of testing of a new of our new cultivar that might get commercialized in the end. And after more than 15 years, it might happen that your cultivar that you have selected with uh, improved qualities will reach the shelf and the farmers will be able to buy the seed. So more than, more than 15 years for one cultivar to reach the shelf. And as well, you would like to have this new cultivar to be ranked on, uh, highly on the recommended list of cultivars. Looking more in depth into the genotypic recurrent selection, you start the process with a large number of pair crosses to generate F1 families. Then you grow your grass in isolation in the field to generate F2 families. Next, you collect enough seed for a field trial. And once you have that, you can establish a trial and then collect data um, for two years. So in total, this brings you to seven years of the, of the one cycle of product development. And how do we select for improved traits? There are different traits that farmers can be interested in. Uh, they are mostly interested in the dry matter production uh, as well as how much silage they can get. So how much grass can be gathered from the field and kept for uh, winter to give to the animals. As well, uh, we are interested in persistency, which is a change in yield over time. So we would like to have cultivars that they will be great on the first year, but they will be also very good on their fifth year and, and so on. As well, we are interested in the quality of the grass. So for example, a protein content, and this could be a good protein uh, content as well as water soluble carbohydrates. Uh, but another thing is also important, the digestibility of the feed. And the first three, the three traits are relatively easy to measure, whereas the quality is difficult to measure because uh, it's an expensive, labor-intensive and time-consuming process. And usually you wouldn't have enough um, budget to cover sending all of the samples that you have gathered from the field to the laboratory for independent testing. Uh, in terms of genetic gain for quality, our colleagues in Moore Park um, performed a study where they looked into the uh, last uh, 40 years in the perennial ryegrass breeding program, and they found that there is an average annual genetic gain for dry matter yield under two different managements, but in terms of grass digestibility, there was no evidence of an overall trend. And it, goes to, to the, and it goes to the fact because we haven't been really focusing much on the digestibility. There uh, wasn't um, a process in place that would allow us to check the digestibility of the cultivars and to select for this trait to have an improved cultivar. And this was the goal of my project, to develop tools for prediction of feed quality, such that they could be used for routine measurements of feed digestibility in the perennial ryegrass breeding program. 
and the objectives of the project was to focus on four quality traits of the crude protein, ash, and organic matter digestibility, as well as neutral detergent fiber. And um, organic matter digestibility tell, tells you a fraction of the feed that is digestible to the animal, whereas neutral detergent fiber tells you about a fraction of your feed that is undigestible to the animal. So these are complementary traits. And then I was to develop and validate new infrared spectroscopy calibrations, uh, calibration models, and as well uh, develop genomic prediction models and run genome-wide association studies to find markers in DNA for traits of interest. So uh, let's start with the first stage of my project, the phenotyping, the NIR data acquisition, as well as development of the calibrations. We had a reference population that has been set up in an established field trial. And it was a space plant field trial with two replicates, uh, two managements, conservation and simulated grazing. And the individual plants have been genotyped by sequencing. So what you have in the field, uh, those were 10 varieties, eight full seed families, uh, eight half seed families, and four ecotypes. And the individual uh, grass lumps that you can see in the picture, those are individual genotypes. And each of those have been observed, analyzed, and scored according to different uh, criteria that we used. And as well, for each of the genotypes, we've got those uh, genotyping by sequencing profiles from the DNA. Up to date, uh, we, we published, uh, the, um, in, in published our results on the genomic prediction of the crown rust resistance for this population, as well as for the heading date and for the uh, aftermath heading. And now we are moving towards the quality measurement. So this, the same field trial has been used to collect uh, samples from three different years. So from 2015, 2016, 2017, we collected the uh, spring sample, so uh, an, an early sample. As well, in 2015, we also connect, uh, collected uh, samples coming from the summer and autumn cuts. So in total, more than 14,000 NIR scans have been acquired of milled grass samples for this training population. And uh, this also means that we've got a library of 14,000 samples, uh, grass samples that are available to us. And then after uh, two years, we had a follow-up trial, um, an F2 families trial where the space, plant, um, pl space plants have been used to create F2 families. Uh, and then uh, the, the trial was started in 2018. And I was able to collect samples in 2020. And in total, we collected more than 1,000 samples for the processing. Why this is important? The F2 families allow us to collect additional data, so the yield data from a whole sword, because before we've, the training population was mostly built with individual plants on which you cannot uh, collect information on the yield. Whereas when you have a sword, which is a mixture, a population of uh, closely related individuals, from a plot like this, you can then collect the yield data. And we also collected the DNA from the plants and we genotyped them. So in total, looking at all of the samples that we have collected, it was more than 15,000 samples um, collected over five different years, different seasons, and the samples were coming from the space plants and F2 families trials. After each sample has been cut, uh, we had to uh, process it. it, so we started with oven drying at 60 degrees, then we milled the sample to obtain um, homogeneous material, as much homogeneous uh, as possible, and then we obtained NIR scans for each of the samples. Next, so that we wouldn't have to be sending all 15,000 samples to the laboratory to obtain a reference laboratory measurement, which, which wouldn't be possible, uh, we decided to create a calibration subset on which we would then uh, build our prediction models. And I used the distance between two points in multivariate space, called the Mahalanobis distance, to find representative samples. So how I did that? I had a spectra of all of my samples, uh, and then I use the principal component analysis to represent the samples in a new space. 
And then uh, you can see that my samples from the training population are here represented with gray dots and the representative samples that we have found are uh, colored in red. And um, we actually had three stages of the calibration development. So we started with a relatively small number of samples that we first, first uh, will, uh, were able to scan. So these were mostly samples coming from the first spring cut. And as well, uh, you will see on the diagram that we've got in gray, my whole, my whole training population, and in the red, the selected calibration samples. In the second batch, we, uh, we had more samples that, that were coming uh, through, uh, through the NIR scanning. And you will see that now I'm representing the previously selected samples with blue and the newly selected samples with red. So as you can see, as we increase the number of the, of the samples and as well as we occupy new places in the subspace, uh, we, we can find uh, new representative samples that will be complementary to what we had before. And in the third, third stage, uh, I was very happy that we had a nicely densely populated uh, uh, subspace with uh, representative samples that looked truly representative. And in total, we have selected uh, 219 samples and we've sent them to the laboratory for a reference a laboratory uh, analysis on organic matter digestibility, neutral detergent fiber, proof protein, and ash. And if you would like to see uh, and, and do your own analysis, your own selection of a calibration subset, I have also cre created an interactive tool that is available online. So the link is shown here. Um, and you can try to work with my example data as well. You can uh, input your own data and find your own calibration subset representative for your training population. Now, before moving to the development of models, I have uh, focused a little bit more on the detection of outliers. And to do that, I used a robust PCA. So I was interested in finding two different um, thresholds, basically um, um, orthogonal distance threshold, as well as the score distance threshold. And in the lower part of the diagram, you will see samples that um, sit nicely in your hyperplane. So in blue, we've got samples that are uh, called the regular observation. In this panel, this, this last panel here, we would have good leverage points. Um, whereas in the upper part of the diagram, what you see, these are samples that were found to be orthogonal outliers. And the problem with orthogonal outliers is that they can, um, they can give you problems when you are creating models, but there are different types of orthogonal outliers. So the samples that are here marked with yellow, they are simple orthogonal points that do not have much power. Uh, but if the same orthogonal point will be as well after the threshold for score or distance, this will be then called a bad leverage point that would need to be removed from your calibration subset if you are building a calibration. Um, as well, you could try the, uh, you can try uh, removing the orthogonal outliers from, from your models, but I found that in my case, maybe it was because uh, my calibration subset is still very small. Removing removal of the orthogonal points um, decreased the predictive ability of my models. So I kept the orthogonal points unless they were bad leverage points. And then having the spectra and reference laboratory values, I tested different combinations uh, in a k-fold cross-validation approach in R. So I tested different spectral treatments the multiplicative scatter correction, standard normal variate, baseline, the trend, and as well combination of different treatments. And then I also um, tried different mathematical treatments. So the first order derivative, second order derivative, and I applied a little bit of savitsky golay smoothing uh, to uh, remove a part of the noise uh, that we had in our spectra. And I also use two models. I use partially square regression, which is a gold standard in uh, forage analysis for quality traits. And as well, I tried elastic net, which is uh, an approach that allows you to use um, both uh, ridge regression and lasso 
um, by using a ratio of those two approaches. And then what I did, I was mostly interested in the prediction performance in terms of root mean square error of prediction. I was also looking at mean absolute percentage error, but usually it would give me the same uh, results as when I would be looking at minimize, minimization of uh, RMSE. I was also looking at the uh, residual predictive deviation, so the RPD. Uh, it's a um, calibration um, prediction metric that allows you to tell how good your calibration will perform on a new, new subset. And what you are typically trying to achieve in uh, the fodder analysis, you would like to have RPD higher than three, of course, as high as possible. But even uh, an RPD of 2.5 will give you an information that your calibration can be used for the screening purposes. So let's start with, uh, with different, uh, different models that I have developed for ash and fruit protein. So what you see here is we have different uh, spectral treatments. And in color, I'm showing different mathematical treatments. So we have no treatment, first derivative, and the second derivative with Savitsky Belay's moving. In the top panel, we've got results for ash. In the upper, uh, in the lower panel, we've got results for crude protein. And the, the most striking, striking comparison is, of course, a comparison between two models. So a PLS model in the left part and elastic net in the right part. So for ASH, as you can see, there is not much of a difference between different models, and it would be very difficult to find the one combination that outperforms the rest. Whereas for crude protein, we already can see that we achieve lower root mean square error of prediction when we choose to use the elastic net over PLS. For OMD and NDF, the uh, situation is somewhat similar. So for NDF, it would be difficult to find one model that outperforms the, the other. But for OMD, you can see as well that elastic net um, gives us better results uh, on the validation set and then the partial least square regression. So the best models, the best models that I have built with 162 samples, so this is not my full calibration uh, sample that I wanted to have uh, in total. Uh, I'm still waiting for the results on the final batch of the samples that we have sent out to the laboratory. So based on our information that we have for 162 sample, uh, 62 samples, these are the best models for each of the traits. Uh, and um, so you can see that for in terms of models, the optimal models are coming from elastic net. Uh, different mathematical treatments were chosen, but uh, baseline and combination with baseline or, or the trend and multiplicative scatter correction give us quite good results. Um, and you can as well see that um, the models that we obtain are the best for NDF and crude protein, uh, wh where we see an R squared of 0.91 for NDF and 0.9 for crude protein, and as well a high RPD of more than three for NDF and more than 2.5 for, for crude protein. The, cali the calibration models for OMD and ASH aren't as, as great. Um, uh, I think that the final batch of the samples will give us more information about ASH uh, because in the last batch of the samples, most of my samples are coming from the swords. Uh, and this, this could potentially contribute to the, uh, to the prediction of ASH. In terms of OMD, we might have hit um, the highest predictive ability for this trait, probably uh, what is possible because we have a program already at the level of uh, the reference laboratory uh, analysis where we are not totally confident and there is a big error in the measurements there. So of course, with NIR, we might be able to slightly improve uh, over the reference laboratory method once we have a fully developed calibration, but we will not be able to beat it, uh, to, to improve it too far. And then the best models uh, that I had, I used to predict on the full data set of 15,000 samples for downstream analysis with general prediction. 
So these are some saliency maps. For each trait, you would see a mean spectra with the applied combination of spectral and mathematical treatments. And then I'm just plotting regression coefficients according to uh, their contribution to the model. So um, the highest positive uh, contribution would be marked with orange and the lowest contribution would be marked with, uh, well, the lowest, the highest importance on the negative side would be marked with uh, blue color. And you can see that, for example, for crude plotting, we've got a very small number of wavelengths that have been selected, so only 12 wavelengths. Uh, for NDF, uh, these are 39 wavelengths selected by the model. And for OMD, uh, this is 81 wavelengths selected for the model. And this is something that we have, uh, well, basically expected because OMD is the most complex trait out of all, all of the traits that we have here uh, under analysis. Um, just to look a little bit at the overall trait correlations, uh, you will see that we found that there is a positive correlation between crude protein and ash, and as well we've got a very strong uh, negative correlation between NDF and OMD. And as well, this is something that we have expected. NDF gives, uh, gives us information on the undigestible, undigestible part of the feed, whereas OMD gives us information on the digestible part of the feed. So a negative correlation is to be expected. Having all of this information, we consider different linear mixed models. Um, and then we choose, cho have chosen an approach to look at traits as season specific. So uh, spring digestibility, summer digestibility, uh, autumn digestibility. And wherever possible, so for spring digestibility, we could, take, uh, we could have taken a year as a fixed effect. Uh, so then my formula to predict uh, estimated marginal means was that my trait of interest depends on a year as well as on a rep and a block, which, which goes back to the established field trial. And my ID means my genotype, my individual plant uh, with, uh, with a corresponding genotype for which we have the GPS data. So then uh, I decided to focus on the best linear unbiased predictors uh, on the level of families. So I wanted to not look at the individuals uh, that I had, but look at to try to find the best families with the best individuals, of course, inside. And what I did, I estimated marginal means with a package M means. And these are the results that we have. So we've got 35 different uh, families and um, the results are shown as follows. We've got a dot that tells us the estimated marginal mean and then we have confidence interval. And it might be difficult to see, but there are some populations where the confidence interval is narrower, where, uh, whereas there are also some populations where the confidence interval is wider. And here I'm coloring my, my families by um, the type of the material that was there. So we've got cultivars, we've got full zip families, half zip families, and as well ecotypes and controls. Um, the results that I'm showing on this slide are for ash and crude protein. And there was a positive correlation, if you remember that when we looked at the traits and it's seen, it can be seen also as here. So there is a similar trend. If you look at the plants, if you have more of, uh, of protein on one side, we'll probably also have more of ash on the other side. But more important trait for us, traits for us are uh, NDF and OMD. And in here you can clearly see the trend where there is a negative correlation so uh, the higher the OMD, the lower the NDF for, uh, for the, the family in question. And the families that we would like to be focusing most on are the uh, families where we have a very low NDF value as well a very high OMD value. So let's now look at the data slightly differently. Uh, let's see which of the families are coming from the IBERS material. An IBERS material, and these are cultivars that have been developed in Aberystwyth. 
and they are known to be highly digestible. So it was very interesting for us to see if really the, the cultivars that have been deemed digestible would look uh, would also appear digestible in our established trial. So if you will see that um, a family is marked with green, this means that a family is coming from the iverse material. And these are the results. So as you can see, uh, it's, it's really true, the iverse material uh, contains cultivars that are highly digestible. Uh, what is promising to us is that we also have uh, quite a lot of families that um, can be competitive to the IBERS material, which means that in our perennial rye grass breeding program, we've got a promise. Um, we, we have a chance to be able to focus on truly highly digestible uh, cultivars and select for the digestibility. So let's now maybe try to find a different distinction. So I was interested in looking at my top 30% of the, of the families. So I'm just basically putting an artificial threshold where I want to see which plants are from the top 30 and which are not in the, in the top 30 of the digestible plants. And now we can transfer this information and look at the F2 families. So now what I will be showing you uh, is if there was, uh, if, if the sword, if the F2 family originates uh, from a family that has been deemed top 30, and there, there's only one top 30 parent in, in, the, in the mix, we will see uh, the family marked with uh, green. And then if there are two, two, two top parents, uh, in the F2 families, then we will see uh, a bluish a bluish hue. So how does it work? Um, in terms of ash, uh, we can plot the line of a 10 percentile. So this is the threshold of 10 percentile. And what would what we would be interested in are the F2 families that are in this uh, lower end. So these are the most digestible. Uh, uh, well, not cultivars, but families uh, which could be in the future selected for. So uh, this this one end is really rich in green and as well bluish bluish uh, fa uh, families. And on the other hand, the uh, the right hand side, you can see that uh, the plants that are not digestible, they are only marked with the orange color. In terms of crude protein, oh, sorry, in terms of NDF, the situation is not as clear, but still we can see that probably there is a little bit more of the green and bluish uh, colors on the, on the lower end here. Now for the OMD, we are looking, um, looking at the, this differently. So we are now interested in the 90th percentile. And as well, you can see that in the 90th percentile, so our top 10, uh, we mostly see the color green and blue. And in the, the, in the lowest digestible plants, you can see that they are marked mostly with, with the orange. For crude protein, it, um, it doesn't make any sense for us if we do this kind of analysis, because it looks like we've got, um, uh, and we, we can see that there really is no colocalization of plants that, have, that are originating from top two parents or one top parent. But it goes back to the structure of the crude protein or the, or the variation that we have possible uh, in the uh, space plants. So as you can see, if we were to make a line of top 30, we would be more or less uh, taking half of the, of the population. So there is not a lot of uh, variance here for the crude protein. Now moving on to the genomic prediction and genome-wide association studies. I want to first start with showing you once again the, the, one, once, the one cycle of product development, so the genotypic recurrent selection. And as I have showed you before, it takes seven years to get from the first stage of the genotypic recurrent selection to the last stage. But what we hope to see uh, is that with genomic selection, we might be able to decrease this time to one year or even do multiple cycles of selection uh, during one year. Genomic selection has the potential to reduce time needed for a cycle of selection and increase the selecting intensity. So how does it work? 
uh, you basically have your training population, the one that we had uh, already uh, seen, and you obtain a profile of DNA for each of the, uh, of the, of the plants. And as well, you measure the traits. And in our case, we are using NIR predicted phenotype values. And then you use this information to develop genomic prediction models. Then in your offspring, you can collect only the DNA and build the DNA profiles and predict the breeding values using the already developed genomic prediction models. What this allows you to do is you can grow more plants in a glass house or in pots. You don't need to go to the field and establish a field trial. You might be able to, in theory, of course, to predict feed quality only using the DNA without going through the whole process of obtaining forage data and processing all of the samples. So how the genomic prediction works? Uh, we took the quality values and averaged them per genotype or obtained the estimate uh, marginal means. We, genotypes with low sequencing coverage were limited, were eliminated, and then we used, um, when we had markers with more than 25% missing data, we removed them. And missing data for markers was mini-included. So this is a typical process that you would go through for genomic prediction. Then we have applied rich regression based linear unbiased prediction on a full uh, set of markers, as well we looked into some smaller sets of markers. And we um, try to see uh, what are the genomic prediction models that we can come up with when evaluated with a Monte Carlo cross-validation by randomly assigning plants into training and test sets. Uh, and the predictive ability that we had was determined as the person's correlation coefficient between the observed phenotypic value and predicted phenotype. So some results um, for the spring digestibility, uh, these are the, the values for the predictive ability that we had with our models. And you will see that there are some additional traits because we obtained also values um, from a previously developed calibration for dry matter digestibility and water-soluble carbohydrates. So for our traits for OMD, which is already quite poorly predicted on the level of NIR, we had a predictive ability of 0.35, for NDF uh, 0.38, and for crude plotting 0.4. For the summer, uh, summer cut, you can see that we actually have a quite high predictive ability for NDF. And this also makes a little bit of sense because uh, the plants in the summer will have probably a higher production of NDF, uh, a slightly different um, developmental stage. And uh, we hope that once we will have all of the information on the NIR, we will be able to even improve our genomic prediction models. However, this cross-validation uh, makes, makes a situation when you will not have the same individual genotype in the training and test population, but you might be able to see uh, closely related individuals, one in the training set and one in the test set. So there's a different cross-validation that you can consider. I leave one family out. So you take all of the related, uh, related individuals from one family and you keep them for the validation and you build then your model on the rest of the training population. So for the spring digestibility, our uh, average predictive ability for DMD was at 0 0.06 with a, a standard deviation of 0 0.22. In comparison, the predictive ability for a random Monte Carlo cross validation was at 0 0.41. So as you can see, it's a huge drop in predictive ability. But if we look at the overall statistics, it's never a full picture. So actually, when you create a box plot and you look at the different values for um, predictive ability for each of the folds, so for each of the iterations where you had one of the families left out, uh, you will see that there is a group of populations which are quite nicely predicted. So if we had the baseline um, predictive ability at 0 0.41, there are more or less four populations that we were able to predict with slightly reduced predictive ability, but uh, close to 0, 0 0.4. Why is that? It goes be, uh, to the established trials. So you've got 
our cultivars, full seed families, half seed families, and the ecotypes. And the highest predictive ability that we obtained was, for example, for family Tyrella. And family Tyrella is, um, is here in, in one of the cultivars. And this, was, this uh, family was taken out in the iteration, but we've got a full sip family a cross between Salomon and Tyrella that are present here in the full sip families. As well for the next family, Pastor and Genesis, you can see uh, that we've got uh, a cultivar Genesis in our training population when we are trying to predict on the full sip family uh, a cross between Pastor and Genesis. And it's also true for other, uh, other varieties. So it just give, gives us more information into that we need to have uh, related individuals in our training and test populations if we want to use genomic prediction following this approach. In terms of genome-wide association studies, uh, we were able to look at spring digestibility and we found um, one significant hit for the NDF on the second chromosome. And as well, we have a couple of uh, significant hits on the second chromosome for the OMD. For crude protein, we've got only one significant hit, uh, and this is also on the second chromosome. For autumn digestibility, we were not able to find any significant hits, uh, not for NDF, not for OMD, and not for crude protein. This is probably because uh, for the autumn digestibility and as well for the summer digestibility, we only have information coming from one year uh, and the effect of the environment is very strong. So for the spring digestibility, where we've been able to collect data over three different years, our estimation of the genetic variance is much better. And as well, we will have to rerun all analysis with the last batch of reference laboratory results for calibration samples when they come back, once they come back to us. How can we use this information? We can take all of the traits into consideration to determine the value of a selection candidate because we, want, we don't want to be only focusing on high, digestible, uh, high digestibility if we lose on the dry matter yield. Fortunately, we can use our information coming from the recommended list and we can use the pasture profit index to provide us weights in, um, in calculating the genomic estimated breeding value for annual cultivars. And this is exactly what, what we want to do in the future. Uh, once we will have all the data, we will use the pasture profit index weights, and then we will uh, perform a validation of genomic selection by following a positive, random, and negative selection uh, to produce a range of synthetic cultivars, Then we will test them in the field, such that we, we want to be able to tell in the future if it's possible to use this approach to improve uh, our cultivars and decrease the time that is necessary to follow uh, one cycle of product development. To conclude, the developed NIR calibrations can be used in the routine breeding, and we hope that the genomic prediction will be also used in the future, but we need to still establish a proof of uh, concept. And we hope that, that with the models that we have developed, we will be able to answer a question, which plants should be used to create synthetic cultivars, so the best uh, cultivars that will be in the future, uh, uh, that will undergo uh, very rigorous testing and might in the, in the end in the future end up on a shelf for the farmers to pick a seed and sow it in the field. And in time, we hope to be able to increase quality of grass sown in Ireland. And this will have an impact on milk production, animal welfare, and as well, it's been shown that a higher uh, quality of a forage, so a higher digestibility, uh, can also translate into lower production of methane by cattle. I would like to acknowledge my team uh, here in Oak Park, but as well our collaborators in UCD Insight. Uh, I had a great team and um, most of my thanks go to Stephen Byrne, my supervisor. Uh, but as well, I think we have, we've got Rachel Kirsa now on the call, uh, who, uh, who has been helping me with obtaining all of the NIR uh, information. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yes, right on time.
Uh, if someone on the on the call has some question for Fernieska, please simply unmute yourself and ask them. Otherwise, I'm going to have some because actually I was curious about something. Because one thing is related to like probably the last slide, the one before the one before this one, where you're saying that it might, as you know, I mean, I worked uh, in Vista Milk mainly on the milk side and not on the grass side. And I was asking myself how everything can like, because Vista Milk is trying to build a, a sort of a whole center starting from, from the grass to the, really to how the humans digest the milk. I mean, do you think it's, because for example, I work on recognizing if uh, a cow was eating grass or not. But do you think that from the MIR, in this case of the milk, we can also recognize the type of the grass? Do you have a feeling that is also having that strong impact on something that we can routinely analyze on the milk itself? Yeah, I think so. I think we should be able to develop models that will allow you to predict which type of feed uh, a cow was eating. And this might be very much important in the future because now uh, farmers are trying to incorporate clover in their uh, in, in their field so we will we will see an increase in the use of clover but as well there will be some others additives so uh, this will be very interesting in the future to see how it how it relates to the milk mir data yeah because it was easy to recognize for me at least from a data analysis perspective it was easy to recognize if they were eating grass but here it it has to be more tricky. I mean, if you are simply comparing different type of grass and cultivars and so on and so forth. So I was asking if there is a question from Abin Bola. You can you can simply unmute yourself and ask. Um, thank you for the wonderful um, presentation. It was um, a very nice um, work you're doing. But I was just wondering, like you know, the ash results that you showed. Um, I would expect maybe like um like an indirect relationship with, between the organic matter and the ash, and most times you're able to predict organic matter you know very easily. So I'm wondering why the ash is like if it's like you know the result is kind of low in prediction. What do you think? Yeah, I'm still waiting for this third batch of the samples, and um, be this this batch of the samples is very important because the individual plants they are sampled by hand so there is a risk of uh, as well contaminating your samples potentially with with maybe soil particles uh, so it's a different system than when you have a harvester that just goes through a rough plot at the level of i think five centimeters already so uh, I think we just need more data for the, for the prediction of ash, especially having those very different established trials. So space plants versus the swords, this is very much diff difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see more um, coming from the, the calibrations for ash. Uh, when I was looking at different, well, at the important wavelengths for the prediction, I was uh, always able to find wavelengths with an interpretation for OMD, NDF, and crude protein. But for ASH, it didn't make any sense. So I think yeah. it's just that we are missing still a, a, a very important part of the data. OK, OK, thanks. Because I, I know most times it's always like an indirect um, relationship between organic matter and then the ASH kind of. So yeah, that's what I was saying. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, if I just if I can just uh, add something more, the organic matter and organic matter digestibility are quite, are quite different. So we are yeah, looking exactly. at organic exactly. matter digestibility. It's it's a, a way to estimate what happens in a cow during mm -hmm. the uh, digestion. So um, we still need need to improve our reference laboratory method for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I I'm, I'm more confident in our results for NDF. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There is also Julio with the hand raised, so Julio, you can ask it. Yeah, so hello, Agnieszka. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to, go, to congratulate you with you because I really enjoy your, uh, your presentation. Very nice graphs and uh, really. Um, actually, I have uh, just a few curiosity that I wanted to ask you. 
Uh, the first one was uh, when you showed the, the Malanobis distance that it was the criteria to choose the, uh, the samples to... Um, did you apply like a threshold, like a certain distance between a point, uh, between a sample and another sample? Or uh, what, what was the criteria to choose uh, those, uh, those samples? Um, can you still see my presentation? Or well, not really. <laughs> Uh, not really. No. Not really. Okay, I will just go back to that. So I was using uh, some parameters. It was a uh, the approach that I have taken was a Parfain uh, algorithm, and there you you give it two parameters basically, um, the initial distance that you want to have between two points, uh, mm -hmm. and as well how much of the variance you want to explain. Okay. Uh, for the full full model, and by tweaking those two parameters, you can drastically change the number of samples and which samples will be chosen for uh, your representative subset. So, if you actually go to my, um, if you can see it, if you will go to the okay. link that I have provided, uh, there you can just try different uh, different parameters. Um, so I would say, obviously, it's nice to cover as much of the variance as possible and have a small distance in between. But in our case, what we had was a optimi optimization problem. So we had 15,000 samples and we wanted to have a small, a, a small, well, as low, a lowest number of the samples uh, as we could have to make a representative sample. And the, the number of samples that I finally selected it goes back to our agreement with the laboratory. So they uh, agreed to take around 200 samples. So then my job was to have in this con these constraints to find the, the best samples that I can set out. So uh, I was able to limit myself to 219 samples. I would love to have sent them 600, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't possible for us. So 219, it's the minimal uh, subset that uh, I have sent out uh, to obtain a reference laboratory values, but uh, the calibrations will be updated, they will be modified yearly, so I really hope that we will be able to get to a higher number of the samples so that the calibration then will be more robust. So right now it will be very specific to the type of the samples uh, that we had in our training population, but in the future it will grow. Okay, thank you. Uh, just another curiosity, sorry. <laughs> um, when you showed the, um, basically the, um, when you run a blab for uh, the estimation, I don't remember, did you call them like, uh, let's call them EBV simply, mm -hmm. before the genomic selection. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, um, Sometimes I'm asked by, by reviewers for uh, when I do this kind of, of uh, things uh, is to estimate, I don't know if you did that, uh, is to estimate the genetic correlation between the true value of, uh, say, ASH mm -hmm. and the predicted value of uh, ASH. And uh, I think uh, it, it can be something nice to see because uh, you may get, it may justify, say, um, a prediction model with a low accuracy of prediction. Because sometimes they say, oh, that's a very low, that's a low accuracy of prediction. So this model may not be useful. But actually, if you estimate uh, the genetic correlation between true and predicted, uh, normally you get a, a strong correlation. And this yeah. justify the use of uh, NIR prediction for um, for genetic purpose. Uh, I don't know if you did that, but uh, if you have the chance, uh, it would be nice to to see that. Yeah, I think I, I I know where you were going. So you want to all, as well include the heritability in the mm -hmm. in the prediction. Yeah, we are planning on doing it. So I so now I, I haven't uh, really estimated the heritability of the traits. Uh, because we are still waiting for the data, but as well because we, we've got only one location, so it's a narrow sense heritability. But yeah, we will do this because then our results in the predict predictive accuracy will be probably higher than we, we are now given for the predictive ability. So yeah, that's that's a good good note. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, my last, and that's really a curiosity, uh, when you did the genomic uh, selection, the genomic prediction, sorry, 
on your uh, your y variable was it the estimated marginal mean or was it the uh, nir predicted uh, phenotype it, itself genomic prediction sorry i need to think about it the genomic prediction is built for the individuals so yeah, not yeah, but, uh, you, you you estimate say a a, a prediction equation between uh, each uh, snip and uh, your trait but uh, your uh, trait on which you so your y variable on which you build up your uh, your uh, genomic prediction model was it uh, the this so the estimate marginal mean for uh, say crude protein or was it the nir predicted uh, crude, um, crude protein uh, it was an estimated marginal mean for okay. the individual genotype yeah, I, I didn't include it. So I, I wanted to, you know, close my analysis on the swords only on the level of the families. But for the prediction, we were looking at the estimated marginal means for okay. the, so the blobs for, for individuals. Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty much what we do in, uh, in animal breeding. Okay, thank you. It's good to hear. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. There is another question from Abin Bola, actually. You can Sorry, just a quick one. Um, it's not like a question. Um, since you have um, you're determining the um, organic metadigestibility, I'm just thinking, since I mentioned before about the ash, maybe you could just check and see for just the organic matter of the samples. You know, it should probably give you an idea of maybe what's happening with the ash. That's what I'm thinking, because it's a bit difficult sometimes to predict digestibility because it varies, you know, at different times and. You know, so maybe you can just check the like organic matter of the samples without having to go to like checking the digestibility and see maybe it's what it's saying regarding the ash. So that's what I was thinking. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that, that's a good point. We yeah. actually had it planned in the project to uh, to not be using the simple NDF. We wanted to use the ANDF OM, so the ash corrected uh, yeah. NDF. And there is also organic matter somewhere in the equation. So uh, yeah, we, we wanted to do that, but unfortunately the laboratory wasn't able to provide us with the data. Mm -hmm. They are still developing a pipeline. So what they gave us, they could give us information about OMD and NDF. And now they, the new lab, lab procedure will be probably in place in maybe July or August. So we might be able to just take our samples and to ask them nicely, to, can you rerun them with ANDFOM procedure just to get a slightly better estimate of the digestibility. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see that we are working on so similar things in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> okay, thank you for, for the question. I think we can conclude more or less because it's around three, four where I am, but three there. And so I would like to thank uh, again Agnieszka for the nice presentation and everyone here for the for the interesting questions and for the discussion. Uh, so obviously, if some of you want to, to write Agnieszka, you can find the, the, the email on, on, on the website of Chagast, I suppose. Or anyway, if you can ask me also. And uh, we are going to put the meeting, uh, the, the recording of the meeting on our website on Vistamix, so you can also suggest to watch it to your collaborators and so on and so forth. So thank you again and see you all next uh, month for our next monthly meeting in June. Thank you, Agnieszka, and see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you.